I grew up on a farm in Northern Ireland as a, um, the oldest son. And so the natural progression would have been to have inherited the family farm. And if, otherwise I'd be, uh, as I've said many times, to shoveling cow shed somewhere in, the, in Northern Ireland. Um, I had uh, a very good uh, primary school. I was fortunate to have you know good intellect. So I kept passing exams, went on to the local grammar school where an outstanding headmaster uh, who clearly saw something in me uh, beyond uh, being a, a small farmer in Northern Ireland. In fact, I did at one st stage have a place to study veterinary medicine in Glasgow. Um, but I had to, well, I, again, my headmaster, I owed a huge amount to him, uh, withdrew me from that uh, with uh, full consent and sent my uh, results on to Cambridge University, who offered me a place to study medicine. So a bit of a, a bit of a no-brainer, if you like, you know the option. And I went there to what 1973, and uh, to Clare College, and had three absolutely wonderful years. You know the basic sciences, and from there, came down to St Thomas's uh, to uh, to do my clinical. Um, my mother was a midwife, so I uh, and she was clearly uh, very interested. She'd given it up because having married my dad, you know farmer's wife and mother was a full-time job uh, then and still is probably. Well television medical dramas vary of course some of them are you know embarrassingly off the mark um, and portray uh, an image of, of hospital practice or the practice of medicine wherever it is uh, in a totally unrealistic setting. And then others are uh, reasonably realistic. Children's heart surgery, you know, my main interest, of course, is, is this great attraction. So I've had the television cameras in, in the operating theatres and so on. And you do have a sort of, a re some degree of control over it, but at the end of the day, it's what the producer thinks will, will uh, interest the audience that goes out. And they often look at a slightly dramatic, uh, you know, and, you know, a little minor incident is hyped up to be, you know, a sort of, wow, we a sudden life-threatening thing. The other uh, thing that I have been involved in is um, genuine television medical dramas. And they will have some sort of scenario and they want to try and make it reasonably realistic. So they they invite uh, or they you know they sometimes call you up or email whatever and, and ask to talk to you about a certain scenario and uh, just to try and make sure that they get it reasonably medically accurate and I have uh, uh, almost as it were written a script for one uh, a few years ago you know to say well you know this is what could happen and how to do it. Now, I didn't see it myself, but a colleague saw it and said it was really very good. And I said, well, that's good they did what I said. Um, but uh, it gives you a flavour. But, uh, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's the entertainment industry. And uh, whilst medicine can be entertaining in real life, uh, you know, it's a real world. I'm, I have a particular area of interest now, which is children's heart surgery. But I started out life uh, as a cardiac surgeon and uh, dealing with all ages and you might sort of say well what got me into cardiac surgery and actually it was when I was a student I saw a, a patient who had uh, severe cardiac disease and uh, as a result of a heart attack and then it, he was going to go and have surgery for this and I was fascinated by the prospect of this surgery to treat someone who was really very very unwell indeed and um, what's, the, the technology of the surgery fascinated me. And then afterwards, he was normal. He could walk around and talk to you. And I thought, that's just a minute. I want to do that. So having got into the field, um, you know, a newborn baby, for example, and this great joy of um, mum and dad, you know, at the birth of a new child, the parents are absolutely delighted. The, uh, grandparents are delighted, and those telephone calls, you know, it's a boy, it's a girl, what does it weigh, and so on. And they don't come out with a label saying, I've got a heart problem. They look perfectly normal babies. And then a few hours or a day or two later, suddenly the defect emerges. And these people, mum and dad, two sets of grandparents, perhaps brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, their world just crashes because suddenly this baby is about to die, could die. 
And, you know, only those of us who have been there could ever understand what that is like. And the ability to um, stop that is, of course, an incredible privilege. And uh, I've been out now for uh, 20, 1991, so 23 years fully as a consultant. So many of the babies that I operated on in those early years are now grown up. I'm mean, still at Christmas get cards and, and letters, and you know, some of them, well, many have gone through university, have graduated, have you know, entering life and uh, about to start families of their own. So that's hugely rewarding. But equally at the other end of life, uh, someone, you know, in their 70s who has severe cardiac disease that has suddenly meant that the retirement that they had looked forward to, they can't enjoy it, they, you know, their exercise capacity is severely, severely limited, their wife or husband that had looked forward to sharing retirement uh, has a burden. And to be able to relieve that and return them to active uh, life, independence, uh, so is, is, is a fantastic privilege. And equally, I've had uh, cards and letters, you know, from people in retirement. I can remember one sent from um, the uh, Andes Mountains in South America, which had obviously been a lifetime ambition to go there. And he sent a postcard from, I think it was 10,000 feet, he said, but they, they, he had been to 14,000 feet. And they didn't have any postcards up there, so they sent me this one. You know, what more can you ask for? Uh, the most challenging in, in my job, and it's true of every practitioner, is um, facing failure. So, in, for example, again, the baby that's born with a serious heart condition that you uh, offer an operation, you go into the operating theatre and, you know, whatever condition, whatever is done, doesn't work. You can't get the baby off the operating theatre and, you know, I've had the awful experience of realizing that the heart just won't work, you try everything you possibly can. And then you have to make that, you know, may only be 50 yards from the operating theater to where the parents are waiting. Um, but you've got to make what it seems to be the longest walk of your life to tell them that, you, you know, their baby is, is going to die, or their child, or their, you know, their father, their mother, their brother, sister, you know, their nearest and dearest. And that is a massive challenge, but to not face that uh, is, um, you know, a huge letdown on the part of any practitioner. You see something, and you can see that this is wrong and that's wrong, and you could fix this and you could fix that, but actually, uh, that maybe the best treatment is no treatment because you would. You've got to recognize in all of these situations that, you know, you may be in, uh, aiming to do good, but you have the potential to do harm. And therefore, you must curb your uh, kind of natural instinct, if you like, as a trained surgeon to operate. And I would say that the hardest decision in surgical practice is when not to operate. Um, often the most correct decision. But our instincts are always, you know, to, to operate, because that's what I'm trained to do. I'm a trained surgeon. Uh, there are, there's virtually no baby live born today with a cardiac defect, no matter how um, complex it is, for which we cannot offer something. And uh, there's a big group of patients that, when I started as a consultant in 1991, it was more or less untreatable. That is incredibly rare today. The reason we might not offer treatment would be because of severe associated chromosomal abnormalities that meant that you know you can fix the heart but the rest of it is, is hopeless. The technology has advanced massively, the uh, imaging, you know, the big debate today is does a doctor even need a stethoscope because with all the imaging, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, three-dimensional echocardiography, and I've just come from our weekly conference, the image quality is staggering. We can see things in 3D within the heart that just didn't exist. I remember when I say I saw heart surgery as a student and determined that's what I wanted to do. So by the time I graduated, I, my whole career ambition was to be a heart surgeon. And I can remember thinking, you know, uh, at the end of the six months or towards the end of six months working with the senior consultant here at St. Thomas's, 
And I went to talk to him uh, for advice. You know, was it really a crazy ambition? Was the specialty going to disappear? Was, uh, you know, the job prospects in the future so poor that I would be, you know, stuck forever in, in a training limbo? And, uh, you know, this was the kind of thing that was going through the head of all my contemporaries. Some wanted to be orthopedic surgeons, others wanted general surgery physicians, whatever it is. And so, you know, what I have to say is not specific to heart surgery. And he said to me something which I thought at the time, well, that's a lot of use. But actually, it turns out to be, he said, look, if you really want to do it, and that's what, you're, what is, you know, makes, fires you up, he said, you'll be successful. You will. But if you go into something and, you know, then uh, uh, I really wanted to be a heart surgeon. But if I looked ahead into the future and thought, oh, the job prospects are lousy, but ENT is much better. And I could have gone on and been an ENT surgeon, but I wouldn't have been a very good ENT surgeon because all the while I really wanted to be a heart surgeon. And I think that that would just be equally true of somebody whose ambition was to be an ENT surgeon, who in fact found that the way ahead was no good and, and ended up in another specialty. I think you won't perform as well as if you actually do what it is you want. So the advice is if that is really what uh, has taken your imagination, then I think you will be good at it. Of course, cardiac surgery, and as with most surgery, but cardiac surgery particularly has the aspect that uh, you know technical skills are absolutely crucial. You know, and if you can't cut them so accurately, um, I'm sorry. You know, and there's lots of you know, young lads out there on the council stage who want to be premiership footballers. Well, if, you know, if they can't kick a ball and make it bend to the left and the right and so on, <laughs> I'm sorry, they, they can be absolutely consumed with ambition, but sadly they're not going to make it. And surgery has that aspect as well. You also need to have a good understanding of cardiac physiology and such like, and uh, there's a lot to it. But, you know, a, a sort of passion for it is, is, is crucial.